Hi, Mary. How are you? Thanks for coming. You're very welcome, George. I'm fine. The weather's horrible outside. I really appreciate that you uh, <laughs> that you made the that you made the drive. You know, it's um, the news that makes it sound bad, but driving in was okay. A lot of water puddles and corners. You just have to go a little slower. That's all. And be safe. Absolutely. It seems that every year um, we just keep having the same discussions and people still keep complaining and they, they just think that every year something better is going to happen or something's going to change. There's going to be less snow that falls. It's the same thing. You know, you live in Montreal. It's the mixity. If it was only snow, we can take care of it. But it's the snow with the rain, the freezing cold, and it it, it just freezes, creates a lot of ice. And people feel that they can still drive the same uh, the same way they drive summertime. Exactly. Yeah. You can't. You have to slow down. And pedestrians, you know, back a few years back when uh, Marcel Tremblay said, buy crampons, people laughed at him. <laughs> yeah. And he was, was remembered as a guy who recommended crampons. Well, today, you'd be surprised how many have been sold and how many people are wearing them. Oh, for sure. You have to protect yourself. And after a certain age, when you have difficulty walking, stay home. Yeah. Stay home because going out for that, uh, you know, that loaf of bread or going out for a liter of milk can cause you a break, your leg, your hip, an arm that will never heal and make you the way you were in the past. Oh, it will never heal the same way. Especially past a certain age. Yes. My parents have been wearing uh, those uh, th- that, that footwear many, many years. Yeah. I remember back in college, I think my father was telling me, uh, where are those, by the way? I'm like, I don't think so. <laughs> well, back then, we never knew about it. <laughs> but, you know, when we first came from Greece to Montreal, we lived on Hutchison between St. Viator and Bernard. Yeah. And the first school I attended was Edward VII. That was on, Wa- on um, Wave, no, was on Esplanade and Van Horn. Used to walk in the morning, come back at noon, go back in the, you know, after lunch and then come back home at 3.30. Back then, the blue collars would manage and clean the streets by hand mm-hmm. with a shovel. Yeah. Uh, I remember on icy days, the only way I can get to school and back was hanging on to the, uh, to the fences so that I don't fall. I don't remember people complaining. It was a way of life. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then things evolved. We got the trucks. We got the little tractors on the sidewalks. And then social media came about, and everybody wants it done immediately. It's the, yeah, it's the access to information, right? When you're looking and you're seeing all these images, uh, people falling, uh, snow, ice, accidents. It, uh, of course, it, um, it, it has an impact. Absolutely. It's good for the city managers to be aware that things are not functioning well. Uh, but at the same time, we have to be... Not tolerant, but we have to understand that in one day we had a huge dumping of snow, almost 40 centimeters, uh, followed by rain, followed by sub below zero uh, weather. Everything froze. By the time they finished the parkour, the 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 route, as we they <laughs> say in, yeah. in the states, the route, the route, uh, the snow had impacted the ice below. And then when the they started clearing the streets, by the time my street, I live on Burnham, my side of the street is the last one to get done. And it's not because I'm the city councilor. It's just I live on it's the street. The order, yeah. You know, it's a, it's a fourth priority. So by the time they come to my street, I've got like about four inches of ice above the sidewalk. So when I'm coming out of my driveway, I have to go over that bump. And I have to make the make sure the car rolls. If I press on the gas, I'm gonna get stuck. Mm-hmm. So I roll my car over that and hope that there's no other car coming from Jerry yeah. up my street because I've got these huge vans that park left and right of my house. I can't you see. You can see, yeah. So when I roll over, it's like my heart's pounding and I'm hoping no other car is gonna come and hit me. That's incredible. I want to talk to you about so many things, but before we start, obviously, I follow you on social media. I know your kids, um, that gorgeous granddaughter. 
<laughs> my goodness. Just, t t you know, bringing her thoughts into my mind yeah. by saying, grandmother, uh, my grandchild, uh, she's my first. Yeah. She just turned six months. And all I can say is, what a, a, a God-given gift. For sure. Uh, we speak on FaceTime every day. A day doesn't pass when we don't do that. My daughter sends me videos and pictures of her every day. And uh, it's a joy. It is really a, a gift. It's incredible. I think we've spoken about this. I have two daughters. Um, aside, of course, for from that whole experience of, you know, seeing these uh, these kids for the very first time and holding them. In addition to all that, for me, was also experiencing what that felt like for my parents and my in-laws. And I remember the day you told me that your daughter was expecting that you're going to be a grandparent. I, I just remembered how it, you know, how it how it was to see my parents live through all that moment. I'm like, wow, I was just so happy for you because it, it's extraordinary. Aside it from is, the fact that you're is. happy that you're becoming a parent and everything, just experiencing the joy it brings to the people around you, and especially you know uh, my parents and my in-laws, uh, unbelievable. I'm going to share something with you that uh, it had completely left my mind, my thoughts. Uh, just recently, we celebrated uh, the uh, Chinese Lunar New mm -hmm. Year, and I attended the celebration at midnight at a uh, Chinese temple, Buddhist temple. And after the ceremony, there are things happening around the temple. And I went with one of the uh, board members. And when we went to this, they, they've, they have a statue of the fertility god, goddess. And they have a little pond in front of her. And people basically throw coins and make a wish. And he goes to me, you remember last year? I said, remind me. He says, you tossed a coin. And then it says, you wrote your wish on a paper at the table next, and you went and put it on the wish list. He says, do you remember what it was? I says, yeah, I wished for a grandchild. <laughs> he says, you got it. Within the year, he yeah. says, you got it. So he says, make another wish. Make another wish. And I did. <laughs> so let's see. Let's if see. it happens again, well, you know. We'll make sure your daughter doesn't listen to this. <laughs> we don't want her to plan anything else. Um, it's a great coincidence. Well, yeah. yeah, it is a coincidence. Um, let's talk a little bit about your journey. Uh, I always thought that you were Greek, and then uh, after uh, getting to know you, um, I learned that your uh, that your family was originally from Armenia. You were born in Greece, or you were born in Armenia? You uh, no, 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 no. My dad and his family lived in Turkey. Okay, and. There, that part of my family is Armenian. During the genocide, they fled, and by rowboat, they went from Kudash to Samos. Samos. My dad was three, my uncle was two at the time. Okay. They grew up in Samos. My mother is a Samyotisa, mm -hmm. 100%, uh, Irini Spanu. Uh, my mother's family still lives in Samos. Some live in Athens, and one of my one of my first cousins, uh, because her father's brother was a bishop in Jerusalem, took my cousin Maria, and she uh, was educated in Israel, mm -hmm. and she was married over there. Okay. And she still lives there. It's funny, because when I call her sometimes and I get a, a Hebrew uh, response, I sort of question and say, Maria, is this you? <laughs> if it is, call me back. Um, so my dad grew up in Samos. He fought in the Greek army during the, uh, the war. Uh, he's a Greek citizen. He was. He passed away mm -hmm. 23 years ago. And uh, he met my mom. So they met in Greece, and then you came, into, uh, you came to Montreal. How old were you? I was seven. Seven. So, 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 you, so you still remember this whole journey of coming in here as an immigrant? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I remember uh, back then... The uh, school board enrolled me at Edward the Seventh. I was uh, seven, and uh, they put me automatically in grade one. After three years, I said, you can't attend this school anymore. The school boards must have changed. They went from uh, the French Catholic school board to, uh, they, they must have split the territory, because we lived on the 
uh, Uchman side of mm -hmm. Hutchison Street. So okay. they said you have to go to a Uchman school. Oh, okay, yeah. By that time, uh, they informed me Guy Drummond was already full, so I went to Alfred Joyce, then Strathcona, and then Uchman High. And then you moved to Park X in uh, my, in. Your in not, well, sixty nine, they started building our house. My parents built the house where okay. we live in. Still live there. Brought up my three children. It's amazing, right? You've seen you've seen Park X develop over the years in ways that not many have. So I you, you I lived built... it as a teenager. Yeah. I lived it as a, a married person. Mm -hmm. I lived it bringing up my three children, and the lack of municipal services that we had while my children were being brought up. Our parks were in terrible condition. Uh, we had no swimming pool. We had no library. I had bought uh, the uh, the English Cyclopedia. I had bought the Grolier and Britannica so that they can do their research. Back then, we didn't have computers, right? Uh, plus, I used to go to other libraries, to Evangeline and also to the one in Maidan because we had none in yeah. Park X. Uh, tell me about Montreal uh, in the 60s, 70s. Uh, I've heard so many stories, you know, my dad, my uncles, and it just seems, and I think every generation eventually, you know, they make their own quote-unquote legacy, right? You, know, you live uh, through your, your younger years, but it just seems that their stories are just so much better than ours. <laughs> <laughs> they're different. Yeah. I wouldn't say they're better. They're just different. Um, look, I uh, started working part-time after school. Uh, I worked at Presky's and Woolworth's on uh, Park Avenue back then, uh, a cashier on the weekends. And afterwards, from age 15, I started working at the Royal Vic as a dietary assistant. Mm -hmm. uh, and I stayed there until 1970. Uh, so I was able to pay for my schooling. I um, was able to pay for my own expenses mm -hmm. so that I don't burden my parents with my needs. Yeah. Um, I learned a lot, especially, first of all, to work under pressure because Kresge's and Warworths, they didn't have an enclosed area for the cashiers. We were part of the, uh, the counter where mm -hmm. they had the product. So okay. people were all around us around Christmas time and they're over you. And Chaos. You, the, the, uh, cash registers did not tell you how much <coughs> cash you put in <coughs> and how much to, to, to give. refund. So you gotta count, <laughs> count the pennies, and if you were, if your cash was not correct, you had to pay the balance. Exactly. But it was a. I mean, Montreal is still a vibrant <coughs> city, in my opinion. It is. But back then, I mean, you know, the the stuff that you hear, especially Park Avenue, that you mentioned it, such a lively street, so many things happening, uh, in Montreal at that. Uh, Greek at Avenue. That time. It, it was, was Greek Avenue. Yeah. Almost all the stores were Greek. Yeah. Uh, there were. The Greek community, when they came here in the 60s, we came in the late 50s, but in, in the early 60s, there was a wave of Greek immigration that came into Montreal, mm -hmm. and they came into the Outremont side, as well as the Plateau side yeah. of Park Avenue. And basically, the stores, uh, you call it, you know, any utility or even some of the associations that were developed there Basically, they were they developed to be able to give services to the incoming immigration, mm -hmm. uh, to help them find jobs, to help them with social services. Don't forget, back then there were no social services from yeah. the government mm -hmm. or the city. Mm -hmm. Right. I remember my dad uh, registering me for summer camp in a church hall at the corner of Jeroche uh, and um, Bernard. Okay. It wasn't our religion, but... They had the program. They had the program. You know, we were in a safe environment. It was sometimes a religious environment because they would tell us stories about Jesus. <coughs> Perhaps it wasn't a Greek Orthodox yeah. religion that was taught to us, but it wasn't really religious. We learned about Jesus. We learned about the story, uh, Bible studies, if you will. But at least... We had a safe environment to go to parks, to have uh, programs to keep us busy and to keep us uh, safe off the streets. For sure. So you move into Park X. Um, uh, you were in the travel business. You were Yes. I was in the travel industry for wholesale. 
uh, I developed the customer service for Holiday House. Back then it was Canadian Travel Advisors. Then to change the name to be more uh, attractive to our travelers, we called it Holiday House Tour Maison. Um, it was a, an excellent experience because you learn how to give customer service not today, not tomorrow, but yesterday. Mm-hmm. Um, I did cold calls. I was an area sales manager mm-hmm. and I went knocking on doors of travel agents uh, asking to support our products over and above yeah. what they were doing with uh, the competition. But um, I slowly started increasing our sales because it was customer service at its best. And you know what? I've been doing customer service all my life, whether it was working at the Royal Victoria, servicing patients, being sensitive to their needs, whether it was in the travel industry, making sure that our customers, when they went to their destinations, received what they had purchased. And when there were problems, sometimes I would fly to the destination to take care of it. Mm -hmm. Wow. And now being a city councillor, it's the same thing, but a different level. It's still customer service giving service to citizens who require certain services from the city. Absolutely. How does it start? How did, how did, how does, um, how did you get approached? How, how does the political career start? Because we're going to get to it. I mean, you're celebrating this actually last year. Last or this year, year, 20 years. 20 years. I mean, 20 years in public service is enormous. Uh, I mean, I've worked in politics and sometimes one year felt like an eternity. I can't even imagine what 20 feels like. Uh, it's, it seems like yesterday. Uh, yeah, it, it's very strange because it goes fast, but at the same time, it feels like forever. It's this weird. Um, uh, it's not an industry, but it's a it's a it's a strange environment to be in. Uh, how does it start? Who how, who approached you? Did you have an interest? I mean, you were involved uh, socially. I know that you were involved with PYO, the soccer clubs. Your kids were uh, engaged locally. Um, how much of an impact did that have? on you doing politics? Well, back then, the industry, the travel industry was changing. Uh, Airlines were no longer giving commissions, they were giving net rates. Um, We were in direct competition with people, (coughs) with people going online, or depending on who up their net prices, some would put up $100 more, others would put $25 more for the markup. And it wasn't what it used to be. Our company became bigger. The decision-making, we had to send a requisition to our Toronto head office and then wait whenever it became their priority to come back to us. I had always been used to being able to take a decision and service my people right away. So when that was not available to me anymore, I said I had to look around for something else. But I had no idea what to go into. All I knew was that I'm good with people, I'm good with customer service. Uh, I'm also very creative with my hands. So I didn't know what options I had. Back then, uh, in 98, I get a call from Annie Sanson saying, Mary, I'd like to meet with you. Uh, We want to see if you're interested in becoming our rep, our candidate in Park X. And I remember vividly at PYO, we had a lobster festival and uh, I invited her for lunch. So when she approached me about that, I said, let me think about it. Uh, I spoke to friends, some people encouraged me, others said, Mary, there's a lot of stab back, backstabbing, uh, that politics can change you. Um, so I had the pros and the cons of going into municipal politics. And then Annie calls me and said, can you bring your CV uh, Saturday? We're going to inaugurate the skate park at Jerry Park, and then we'll go for lunch and Mr. Burke would like to speak to you. Now I had met Mr. Burke the year before at the soccer banquet that ARS Concordia had made for the soccer uh, clubs. Was he, I, mayor, was he mayor he was already? Mayor. He was mayor. Yes, he was mayor in 94. Yeah. He approached me in 98. So what impressed me with him was that he was very down to earth. He was just any other person. Mm-hmm. Wasn't, But he was a mayor. He had the title. Mm-hmm. But as a person, he was very down to earth. And that had impressed me back then. Now, I had to create a CV. 
I was with Holiday House for 27 years. I had to start writing it. I prepared something. And when I arrived at Jerry Park, Pierre Pettigrew was there. Now, he had seen me in the previous, uh, at various times, at different activities with PYO or with soccer. So when he saw me, he opened his arms and says, yeah. oh, Mary, how are Pierre you? Pierre Pettigrew, this was the federal uh, MP. Had he, right. Was he already elected uh, at that he point? He was already elected. He was minister. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so I got a nice welcome from Pierre Pettigrew. Mr. Burke uh, also gave me a nice warm welcome. And then we went to the restaurant to have lunch. And I gave him my CV. And by that time, I had made up my decision, thanks to my husband and some of the friends who encouraged me, that I was going to go in and uh, start the campaign. 20 years. Now, keep in mind, 1998, this is a critical, I think, year. I mean, everybody knows Park Extension, uh, the landing dock of many immigrants uh, into Canada, especially, you know, for a long time, it was um, the place where mostly, not only Greeks, but uh, a, a pretty important portion of the population was Greek, uh, came in the 60s, 70s, like you said, and around the mid-90s, that's when they started kind of uh, leaving Park Extension. It was the a new wave. Uh, South Asians started coming in. Um, well, we've always had waves of immigrants absolutely. coming in. Yeah, it usually lasts about 20, 25 years, and that was kind of that transition where, I mean, there's still a lot of Greeks living in Park Extension, but that was the time where you had that new wave coming in. And we're going to talk a bit later about, I want to talk to you about the new wave that will be coming up, because uh, I have a feeling that Park Extension is probably at the very end of, you know, being considered as, you know, that landing dock of new immigrants. I think the next phase for Park Extension is probably, you know, young professionals, young families, entrepreneurs. Um, uh, I think that kind of demographic, but we're, we're going to discuss that a bit later. But so 98 comes around, you have this change happening. You, you... Now, back in 98, there were seven candidates. Mm -hmm. And I would say, if I'm not mistaken, six of them were Greek. <laughs> Yeah. So you can imagine the competition. For sure. I was not involved with the Hellenic community, uh, but I was known by soccer, mm -hmm. the Panelinos, and we had seen the merging during from uh, 1985 <coughs> till that time. It was PYO, Omni, Hermes, and Hellenic. All the clubs, yeah. All the clubs, and we, I, I was part of... The merger. merger until it is what we know today as Panelinos. Yeah. So I was friends with the children and the families. All the soccer families. Exactly. <laughs> and with PYO. Yeah. So back then it was these kids with my children that helped me with my campaign. They did the door to door to put the pamphlets. They helped me putting up the signs in the drizzling. I remember we had drizzling rain at night. We were up till 4 a.m. putting up our posters. And uh, it was three of those uh, young adults now with my son that helped me this past election to put up my posters again. Yeah. It's changed, obviously, campaigning since 98. I mean, uh, computers, uh, you know, weren't that uh, present. Everything was done by hand. How many, how many, uh, uh, how many citizens parking station in 98? In 98, I would say we were about uh, 30, 30,000 okay, so people living there, but they weren't all electors. Yeah, we had about 18, all 18 yeah. 19,000 uh, electors. And today? Today, we're about 21,000 electors, but I would say we're about 40,000 residents. So yeah. I know the government counts uh, the electors to see how you can fund your campaign. But you know what? I still have 40,000 citizens. And whether they're citizens, Canadian citizens or not, I they still, still have to service services, them. Yeah. I mean, it, it's always been, and I think still today, is one of the most densely populated uh, it areas. It is. It uh, is. Probably in Quebec, if not one of the, the top ones in Canada, I'd say. Uh, so 20 years, 20 years in politics. Let's look back at the 20 years. Um, things that have changed, uh, obviously a lot has changed uh, in, in 20 years, obviously demographics, but we're going to get to that later. Uh, you mentioned the library. We didn't have one. I remember... The I first thing, George, that I, I developed 
because I lived it. Back then, St. Rock Park, which was also known as Piggery Park, mm -hmm. had two diamonds, baseball, baseball. diamonds. Baseball yeah. was a big thing mm -hmm. with PYO. But by the time I was elected, baseball had died. Those two diamonds were not being used. Mm -hmm. And it was dead space. However, because beyond the train tracks at that park was Jerry Park, people would cut the fence yeah, I remember. to go through. CP would come mend it, somebody else would cut it elsewhere. So the first thing that I did when I was elected is we got a program and within six months, it took us six months to have the okay from CP to order the necessities, the barricades, the sensors at a certain distance so that when the train is approaching, the barricades come down. Mm -hmm. There's the, uh, the lights, the clang clanging of uh, a sound system to alert the citizens that the train is passing yeah. so that they don't try to cross. Yeah. To date, we have not had any accidents yeah. and it's right next to a schoolyard. Mm -hmm. We fixed it in six months and $350,000. That's all it cost. Mm -hmm. Today, at the Ogilvy passing, between Ogilvy and the Castel No, yeah. which is in front of our offices, the uh, AMT has put in a little shack for people to cross the train track, to go and buy their tickets, and then they walk a bit on the north side to wait for the train to come to take them out. Are you eventually gonna, and we're gonna get back to the to the accomplishments, because, you know. Uh, but it's been 12 years we've been trying to get CP to allow us. It's a level crossing. There is no construction that needs, that is required. It's mostly a security reason, or? They're saying it's security, yeah. but I have at Bow, from St. Rock Park, we have that crossing. Mm -hmm. There's also a crossing on Cremosy and uh, Curbs. Okay. There's also a pedestrian mm -hmm. level crossing there. There's been no accidents there. There should be no reason why they cannot open this. Yeah. The area on the east side of the train tracks has been developed. We have a lot of condos. We have a lot of... Oh, it's uh, incredible. Not only condos, but we also have uh, office space, mm -hmm. a lot of employability on that side. Plus the All metro station is right. Yeah, of course. Because there's so many people now that, because like you said, across that space over there is Villery. Villery is a fast, uh, very rapidly expanding and uh, uh, developing neighborhood. Park X. <laughs> Socially, they're, they're Villery, but administratively, it's Park X. Park X goes yeah, exactly. right up to... Uh, Cass Green. Cass Green. So you have all of Jerry streets. Park, everything. You go That's east right. of St. Lawrence. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But they, they considered Villery uh, for some weird reason. And for, I guess, uh, another reason unknown to me, they also now call it Milex. Milex, yeah. But it's Park X. It's crazy to see these trends get developed. But, uh, but to get back to that point, I've seen people get out of the metro and then walk all the way around. Yes. And then make, well, the, the building that's right uh, on the east side of the train tracks, they have rented uh, a minibus. It costs them $100,000 a year to come over. Transit, yeah. To transit back and forth. Come over to the metro station to pick up their workers. Then they go back, back and forth all day for uh, 355 days a year. Cost over a hundred thousand. It's incredible to think that, that there's a much simpler solution. I understand. I understand that there's security issues, and of course, you can't really compare with the other streets where you have a metro station, um, you have the shopping center. It's it, it's a much more uh, busy intersection over there uh, than the other ones. I would suspect. So, I, and especially with you know now the, the condos and the commercial spots and all the industrial spaces that are being developed across, there's a lot of people. Um, There's a lot of people, but you know what? There's a lot of people crossing at the ball intersection because you have the citizens who want to go over to Jerry Park, mm -hmm. take a walk around before yeah. they come back. Uh, you have children with bikes. You have uh, elderly with wheelchairs. There's a lot of crossings uh, at that side, too. It's sad that sometimes I see tall men. I haven't seen women yet crossing over the fence. Yeah. Because sometimes I see men coming across and a train hasn't passed. So yeah. they must be jumping over the fence. Oh, for sure. Uh, okay, let's go back to um, to the beginning. So libraries, there's there's a lot of, there's an exceptional accomplishment in the last 20 years. I remember growing up in a parking station, we didn't have a police station. 
So that was a huge, huge thing that made a big difference. I remember growing up in Park X and people calling it the ghetto, the the hood, uh, you know, the the street gangs, obviously, the, you know, drug It's all our hood. Yeah. It's all, it's still, we call it, it's our hood. It's still hood. a hood, but it's a safe hood now. Yes, it is. <laughs> And I'm very proud that in the police's uh, statistics, uh, Park X is the least from all the PDQs in the city of Montreal. We're all the way down the bottom. We don't, we don't, really? it's a safe place. And today, if you were to walk in the streets, you'll see a lot of young families with their, uh, with the carriages and the uh, pregnant mothers, mm -hmm. uh, large families uh, of all origin. And uh, the latest trend of immigrants coming into Park X, they're not really immigrants. No. They're coming in from the plateau. Yeah, it's our, our favorite hipsters. Yes. It's changed a lot. And obviously that uh, has uh, to do with uh, the university development project that is happening. Uh, huge not, ne not necessarily. Maybe the students. Yeah. Maybe the students coming in. But the young families coming in from the plateau, it's because we give them municipal services. We have our community center. We have our swimming pool. We have a beautiful library. Mm -hmm. It is a safe place to bring up your family. And all our parks have been redone. Uh, we're adding two new parks this <coughs> uh, summer. Uh, Centennial Park will finally mm -hmm. see its day being constructed. That's the one on Beaumont, right? In the Lepi? No. Uh, the Centennial Saint Park Rock? is next to St. Sophie, ah, St. Yeah. Rock, okay. and Stewart. So this year... Because you announced another park, Beaumont and Delepi. That's right. That's We're calling it, we've already gotten the, uh, we voted on it at the borough and at the city center. It's the... Um, is it the hockey player? Yes. Dickie Moore. Dickie Moore. Okay. Dickie Moore Park. Nice. He was a park exer. Well, it makes sense, right? <laughs> exactly. Uh, but look, there's there's a lot there's a lot of criteria too that explain this new uh, this new transition this new wave. Obviously, the rents are much cheaper uh, than in the plateau and uh, my land areas. Um, you know, we we were sitting together on the board of directors of the SEDEC, which is you know the it's an organization uh, that uh, receives government funding to uh, to invest in social and economic development locally. Uh, I'm not sure if you were there. They had brought in the people from the university to explain to us the project, and it was very interesting. Um, and it's not, obviously it's not coincidental. They, they were uh, they're basing themselves on um, projects that were happening in France. Uh, I'm not sure if you were there, but it, I found it fascinating how they took underdeveloped areas and by building um, university campuses. It exploded the development, both residential, commercial, industrial, and they used that same model when they developed the ETS, which is the uh, Ecole de Technologie Supérieure, uh, Montreal, no Notre Dame, and Peel, yes. and that initiated the whole Griffintown explosion. Mm -hmm. Because I remember going out in Montreal, we never went south of René Levin. No, it was too dark and too scary looking, and for us, it underdeveloped. Was... And you, you know, you you would think twice in. Going there. Absolutely. So for us, it was the limit. And they were uh, uh, using the statistics and they're basing themselves on that project and other projects in Europe where initially that project started to uh, develop that pro this uh, specific project in Park Extension. And, you know, there's a huge radius and obviously it's going to have a huge impact, mostly in Park Extension, um, a little bit in the Myland and a little bit in Nutramont. Uh and in Utrecht, there it's major because they're creating a brand new district with well, uh, the development is housing. in Utrecht. Yes, it is. The problem is that the, the 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 well, there's not really a problem, but the the consequences are affecting equally, if not more, park extension because it's still considered. I don't want to say poor neighborhood, but I mean the cost of living is a little bit less in park extension than it is yes uh, in Utrecht. So a lot of the development projects are happening in in Park Extension rather than in Utremont. And I'm guessing it's the it's the district that has that potential. Everything else in Utremont is pretty much taken. You have residential. It is, park. but that area <coughs> that they cleaned up, that they decontaminated, mm -hmm. that has been uh, div uh, divided, and um, they've already put infrastructure underground and created s spots, uh, lots, to build social housing, condos, and regular rentals. Mm -hmm. So they're they're creating a brand new district in that area of Utrecht. Mm -hmm. 
So I think I think that along with other factors has contributed. You know, this new wave coming in. Yes. I think, uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, we're speculating now, but I think that immigrant wave coming into Parkex is probably at the tail end right now. So the, the question remains, and there's a lot of social groups. I mean, we work the same uh, area and we've, we've had to deal with these social groups and I know that their heart is in the right place and, you know, they're preoccupied that based on the statistics and the reality that we've seen in the Plateau Mont Royal uh, area where when McGill decided to develop, that happened over there. And then we saw the same thing happening in Griffintown and they're suspecting that it's probably going to happen in Park X where the rents are going to go up. Um, but it's different in park extension because the the, the demographics are, are, are different. The, the the poverty is is much higher. People are living under the under, you know well be, below their means. Absolutely. So they're thinking, how is this going to impact? Uh, you know the social impacts it's going to have. Uh, it's fine. I mean, I, I'm, and I'm all for this development project. I think it's gonna it's gonna stimulate economic growth, and I think it's gonna be fantastic for the area. But at the same time. Um, you do have that reality where if rents go up, what's going to happen to the people that are living there? There's, a, you know, I, I, I would like to believe that the owners of existing buildings cannot increase the rent that much unless they modify their buildings and upgrade them. And we've always complained, along with the community groups, that we do have slumlords, companies that had bought these buildings uh, uh, along Lackadie and Burnham, north of Danvers, uh, that had collected the rents all these years but neglected to invest, to invest and, keep, yeah. and keep the buildings in good, in, in good condition, livable condition. Uh, we've done, we've interacted with the community groups against these owners so that they can modify, they can exterminate the, the cockroaches and mice uh, in the uh, buildings and try to give an acceptable uh, living condition to their tenants. I mean, you're collecting a rent and by contract, you're supposed to provide mm -hmm. adequate housing to your tenants. And so we're working with the community groups to make sure that it happens. But if they do invest in certain aspects of the building, the uh, rental board has uh, a document where there's a formula that a, an owner can put down based on how much they've invested. If it's a collective uh, investment or if it's just punctual for one particular apartment, and according to that, there's a formula of how much you can increase. Yeah. So you cannot increase because, oh, you think you're going to make money. Okay, so there is protection. And unfortunately, some of the tenants, when the owner says, I want a $50 increase, if it doesn't justify the reasons, the tenant can refuse. Absolutely. But, <clears throat> sorry, but we're not only talking about those kind of projects. I mean... There are huge developers coming in, buying complexes, and just completely <coughs> renovating. So everyone is out. Well, right now we had the the way the buildings are in Park X, you can't just buy a whole complexes. They're small apartment mm -hmm. buildings, and you can't. You know, large companies will not invest in that. What There's they're basically one, yeah. doing is they're reinvesting on along Beaumont. Yeah. It started with the garages on uh, Bloomfield and Beaumont mm -hmm. where they sold. Yeah. The owners were getting on in age, they got a right offer, they sold, and they created one apartment block condos at the corner of Bloomfield, another one at the corner of Champagne. Mm -hmm. Then they bought another building, somebody else bought another building on Uchamon. Yeah. Now the latest one was at the corner of Wiseman, Stewart, and Beaumont. They're not buying residential uh, properties, they're buying businesses, mm -hmm. Uh, that do not have the same legalities as somebody buying a residential, putting out the residence, and yeah. modifying. So, basically, when it's commercial, we don't have any reason to protect yeah. the tenants there. <coughs> uh, it's a, a private investor buying from a private owner. Mm -hmm. They come to the city, 
and they ask what kind of regulations, what can they build, what kind of projects they can build, and they build according to rules and regulations. And what they're doing is, in developing housing over there, it lessens the pressure of renters going into the district and having a huge demand, which will then could possibly increase rents. Yeah. So we believe that that kind of development along Beaumont is more positive because you're, you know, you get a, a the zoning that we created there was commercial on the first floor and residential on the upper floors. Um, over the years, uh, I, you know, I remember driving through Park Extension and seeing people that we would have never imagined living in Park Extension. So the change has obviously already started. It's going to continue. Uh, people are talking about gentrification. You know, uh, I'm not sure that we can neglect that or ignore that. Uh, pros and cons um, about this change in Park Extension. Um, you know what? As I said to somebody the other day, they feel that this new project along Beaumont and uh, between Wiseman and Stewart that it's for housing for students. And I said, I don't believe that the person who's going to be managing the rentals is going to ask for a student card. Mm -hmm. Anybody who wants to rent can go there. Mm -hmm. um, but there's very little that you can do. I, uh, I also, can't. Exactly. I can't. As you know, if somebody has a building and they're renting out, we cannot control who they rent to. And, and that's a challenge on your end because... People depend on you thinking that you you have this power of controlling what happens in your district, but at the same time... Up to a certain level, George. Yeah, of course. <clears throat> but see, I, I'm reading all these things about properties being sold, and you have all these social groups uh, demanding that the city move in and buy them and converting them into social uh, housing units, and it's fine. I mean, I understand the reasoning behind that, and I know that their heart is in the right place, and there's definitely a need for that. But then we've never but, refused any housing project for social housing, George. I understand that. Every what project I'm saying, that's come to yeah. us, we've always worked with them hand in hand. No, what I'm what I'm questioning is, you know, these groups, they think that you can control anything. And like you said before, it's a private transaction and it goes to the highest bidder. And at the end of the day, I mean, how much control do you want to have over what is happening locally? There was that building on the corner of... Uh, Curbs and Beaumont. Curbs and Beaumont, the old we, uh, kosher bakery that's there. That's right where the city negotiated with them up to two and a half million dollars. We voted on it at mm -hmm. city council. And next thing we know is that somebody went there and outbid us mm -hmm. and offered twice the cost. Exactly. So, I mean, I, I put myself in the shoes of the, the building owner. Of course I'm gonna take the money. Of course I'm gonna take it. And then there's the issue, uh, the building that's right across your office is there on Ogilvy and Hutchison where the same thing happened. That uh, was a ha Hutchison Plaza. Yeah. They got rid of all the businesses inside. The guy's developing. What's happening over there? This is residential? It's supposed to be residential, uh, not condos, but uh, he's going to be... The project that he gave to the city was rental units. And again, you had all the social groups demonstrating in front of your offices uh, for days, thinking that you can do anything. About it. See, that that for me is problematic. I mean, and I understand. I mean, the, the, the groups are there. They're doing their job and, you know, I mean, and within their rights. Of Unfortunately, course. legally, there is nothing that the city can do. If they were tenants, then there's a problem. There we can help. But these were all commercial tenants. Yeah. And they were advised six months ago that this was happening. Yeah. They had six months to leave. Uh, and some, I was told, didn't even pay rent for the last six months. Yeah. Because they knew they were they leaving. They knew they were leaving, yeah. So that went through, it's happening? That went through. Uh, the owner had started doing some renovations without, you know, uh, without a permit. He finally got his permit and then everything just stopped. Uh, and we last heard that he got his permit and he should be starting now soon in the spring. Um, I want to go back to this whole gentrification thing because some people see it as a good thing. Uh, some people say that's a very negative thing, and it, it and it's weird for me because the people that are um, mostly against this 
phenomenon, if you want to call it or whatever, are actually the people that are considered the ones that have started this gentrification. I mean, you don't see any Greeks or any South Asians complaining about gentrification. You have all these youngsters and all these young professionals, and young entrepreneurs, and they're involved uh, socially, and they're complaining about you know gentrification. And you look at them and you're like, you just came here like 10 years ago. You are this gentrification, and you're complaining about it. And I, I mean, to what extent can you block you know, these social or economic developments happening in the district. I have a huge problem accepting that. You know, every case is different and every case has its particularities. When we get people coming and manifesting, militating, militating against certain project, when you sit down with them and you explain the procedure, you explain the things, how it happened and how legally we cannot do mm -hmm. anything about it. It's very difficult to accept that they still manifest against it because they don't want it. Mm -hmm. And what's even more difficult is that the local mayor of the borough uh, votes against projects because she understands, we understand too, but legally we cannot go against the project because everything followed the law. It's just an ideological thing, yeah. So she said sometimes, you know, you guys can vote against it, but I will vote, no, she said you can vote in favor, but she says I will vote against it because it's not to the interest of Park Exers, but to the interest of the borough, <coughs> Excuse me. To the interest of the borough, if we were to vote against the projects after it followed a year, a year and a half of legal procedures, we can be pursued. Mm -hmm. And that will come from our budget, which is limited. And that will hurt our taxpayers. It, at one point, you have to take a responsible decision. It doesn't mean that the rest of us, the rest of the city councillors, are against social housing or affordable housing and we are still working hand in hand with the city center to find there are certain areas that right now are being cited and they're trying to develop them but this constant negative manifestation against all development can work against our developing our social housing because it's going to jack up the prices um, tell me a little bit, I mean, 20 years, um, one of the most challenging things that you had to kind of go through. Uh, in this, first of all, right now, you're, the, you're currently the longest sitting uh, municipal councillor in Montreal, or? No, Marvin no Charles. Marvin, okay. Uh, in your there part? are yeah. others, there are others like Dominic Perry from St. Leonard, but he hasn't been all those years in Montreal. He was in St. Leonard, then he came joined. after with the merge. That's right. Yeah. But basically, it's Marvin Rocha, and I'm the second one behind how do, them. How do you feel? Because obviously, I, I, I'm proud. Exactly. Now, there's a lot of newcomers coming in. Um, do they approach you? I mean, do they see you as a mentor? Do you take them under kind of your wing? There's a bunch of rookies that I'm thinking about, like uh, Effie Janu, um, uh, Adrian Parizzo, maybe even Frank uh, Francesco Miele. Although I think he's in his second mandate, he's not really a rookie. But I mean, Francesco has been there <laughs> for two mandates. He's a uh, Former lawyer, he was also. Um, He's going to be on a podcast, by the way. He's coming. Very good. He's an awesome, awesome counselor. Yeah. Uh, he's also our leader at city council. He manages us well, and he also worked for uh, Stéphane Dion in Saint Laurent at, for yeah, him at the federal. Uh, That's right, there. at the federal level. So he basically has the experience of listening to citizens and working around trying but, to. But all these, all these newcomers. I mean. Is there, uh, do you feel this responsibility of kind of telling, okay, look, let me show you how things work, uh, you know, the sage advice coming from uh, the experience? The my, my office doors, George, have always been open to everybody. Uh, and you mentioned Effie, uh, we talk, we speak, and uh, if she needs advice and she asks me, she has it. Don't forget that I also have a big load 
and a lot of responsibilities in park what, camps. What are your responsibilities now in opposition? Did, have they given cultural you Cultural communities. Cultural communities, okay. That's right. But uh, over the years, 20 years of developing relationships with all the cultural communities, and that has been my strength. Mm -hmm. Well, you've sat on Montreal's executive council for... Uh, you know, for Sports, recreation, social development... Um, but the, the, one, yeah, the, the one file that you have consistently been given uh, has been the cultural communities. I mean, yes. that's, uh, it's a file that you know and that you mastered over the years. But because of my past experience, I also had seniors. I mm -hmm. also had women's issues. Yeah. I also had youth, um, handicapped. So whenever there's an association that uh, needs advice or that needs help, they call me. Tell me about the things you're mostly proud of, 20 years. Oh, gosh. The first thing was my level crossing over to Jarry Park, which gave a very safe way of getting over to this beautiful park that's right next to our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, because I remember with my children, we had to go from Jarry under the bridge and, you know. Well, there used to be a, uh, an overpass over the train, but that... Uh, no. That was like 75 steps up, 75 steps down. I remember, I remember going up there. And, it was, and <laughs> it was on St. Rock, whereas yeah. we live on the north oh, side of Jerry. Mm -hmm. So Jerry was the, the best way. Yeah. But then it was only Jerry and Jean Talon. Yeah. And the bridge over with the 75, 75 steps up and down is not accessible to everybody. <clears throat> you would have mothers, two, three children, uh, a carriage, oh, forget it. bikes, uh, handicapped people, not easily accessible. So when it was crumbling, uh, some people wanted us to preserve. And when that option is no longer a safe place, plus when you come down, it's in the back of uh, Tennis Canada. Yeah. So it's not a safe place either because you don't know who's back there yeah. loitering. Uh, so when the place was, uh, when that bridge was crumbling, we said we're going to demolish it. Yeah. But because it was 100000 to demolish, we just cut off the steps. Yeah. We left the rest standing until there was a project from the city central and they came and they demolished it for okay. us. Um, so the, the level crossing from Ball to me was number one. Number two was the library. Uh, giving access to books to our children, to families, to adults. Uh, but in general, that whole complex over there, which was an old school, and I think the city has taken over and they're renting it out to organizations. There's we're, not, we're not renting it out. We're simply managing the proper use of some of the rooms. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say most of the associations that are housed there, we give them free space. Okay. We don't charge them because they're serving our citizens. Uh, the only drawback, and I have a, a huge concern about the future of our community center, is that we have a large of, uh, we have many large families. Uh, they are truly um, filling up our schools yeah. uh, to the seams. The uh, school board already took the second floor of William Hingston to enlarge their school. Uh, we are using some of the space on the main floor as well as the basement and the sub-basement now, uh, offering sports and uh, taekwondo and karate and judo, mm -hmm. uh, to, as well as social services to our citizens. When will be the next time they're going to start taking space from us to mm -hmm. use it for the schools? Uh, already we lost uh, Centre La Jeunesse because they're, they're redeveloping a school yeah. there. There's a lot of needs. We yeah. have a lot of young families. Well, look, that, that was a, a huge campaign uh, issue in the last provincial elections but, uh, locally. Um, first of all, that project hasn't been retained uh, from from the government, at least the last I heard. But the, <clears throat> the school commission still wants to, to move forward. And that's a huge center. It is. But what we're doing, we have a plan, and we're working on it. 
to use another large center that has a space to accommodate. See, the backup plan that I remember we were working on was the, the old uh, Chinese uh, hospital. But that's already uh, but that's, slated you know, I, I, for social housing. Yeah, the city came in, they bought it, which was something that we were pushing f uh, for. Uh, but with the potential of, you know, the city buying it and developing it for that future uh, center to move in there. But mm -hmm. last I hear, they're moving forward with another with another plan. We, on have, another, housing. we have another project. Uh, it's working very positively. I can't talk about no, no, it sure. because right now it's still under negotiation. Yeah. But uh, what I'm afraid of is we need something in Park X, mm -hmm. one that will belong to the city and one that... Uh, will feel safe. The problem in Park X is that there's no space. Uh, there is. We're plan well, <coughs> one proposal that I'm pushing for is to work around the uh, Harry Morin's uh, arena. Okay. We can build up with elevators. That makes sense, okay. And uh, cover the parking lot. And basically just enlarge the space there. Mm -hmm. So you have your arena below. You build uh, two or maybe three floors if necessary. It's not going to bother anybody. A nice huge uh, sports complex or activity exactly. complex. And the bus stop right, right there. Yeah. So uh, people will have easy access for the community center over there. And it's right next to Howard Park, which uh, uh, a lot of our festivals take place there. So it's a multi-use uh, mm -hmm. park. And uh, thank God that we haven't had complaints from citizens around the park because of all the uh, activities that mm -hmm. take place, uh, because they also come and participate. This is what's a beauty, the beauty of our um, diverse society that has decided to come and live in Park X. They come, they participate, they learn, we share different cultures together. And uh, I'm proud of that. That's something that we developed over the years mm -hmm. by giving them access, by supporting them, by encouraging them. Uh, let's talk about some drawbacks. Things, is there, uh, things that you regret or things that, you know, either didn't go as planned or... George, the biggest uh, disappointment is the level of lack of... Um, the lack of respect of the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, people put up garbage every day. It's been 20 years we developed. It was during my first mandate for the Quartier Sensé, the disadvantaged neighborhoods. We had mm -hmm. 11 zones of which Park X was uh, included. Mm -hmm. And we brought in those large black bins for the garbage mm -hmm. because we had mountains of little white bags mm -hmm. being placed in certain areas. We came up with the green recycling bins. Um, 20 years later, the problem still persists. Still there. Why? And you know what? I don't know why people think they can come and dump in Park X. George, we recently found uh, there's a phenomenon. Somebody in a pickup truck is bringing large black bags filled with garbage. And they're just dumping it? I got five bags in front of my house the other day. Somebody else on Bloomfield, the same thing. I get a call saying that his mother found, uh, he, she actually saw the pickup truck bring in five bags. Uh, and other areas are getting dumping. So it's not in front of me. I'm going to take it somewhere else. Uh, it's not right. Mm -hmm. We don't want the garbage of other areas. Yeah. We have enough of our own. So that's number one. Uh, but we are finding them. We find out who they are. We find them. Ahansa Cartierville, keep your garbage, please. <laughs> Laval, keep your garbage, please. We even had once people is, from... Is, is this factual? I don't want to create any issues. No, here. no, no. We, we, we found proof. Okay. We found proof. Uh, we also have cameras in certain areas. Mm. So, you no, know, when we have proof, uh, it's not right. I remember once uh, at one of the campaigns, I was at the uh, corner office of uh, Bloomfield and Jean Talon. I saw this lady that I know get off the 179 at the corner. She had a little white bag. She crosses the street and puts it in the city's uh, garbage bin from a Hansa Cartierville. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. You know, 
They also have garbage bins next to their bus stops. Why didn't she leave it there and she had to bring it to Park X? These are things that are totally unacceptable. We're not a garbage dump. But over 20 years, George, some areas have improved. Other areas, it continues. But you also have to consider the fact that Park Extension, you know, where it's located, everything crosses through, right? So you have huge traffic coming in and coming out of Park Extension. I mean, at some point, how can you just perfect the management of all these services? It's the mentality, George. There's no excuse why somebody who goes to uh, McDonald's or Tim Hortons, and I mentioned this because it's their bags. I found it in front, you know, I was going to a, a meeting at Sinclair Laird, mm-hmm. and just outside their door, somebody had thrown a bag from McDonald's. Mm-hmm. You have a bag. You finished eating while you were driving. Take it home, put it in your garbage. Yeah. You know, you're, you're littering a schoolyard where yeah. little kids are playing and walking to. Yeah. It is totally unacceptable. Or as they're driving, they just throw it out their window. It's in a, in a bag. Go home, put it in your garbage. You know, I remember having this conversation with you so many times. I don't know how you guys do the work that you do because you're the front line, right? You're municipal uh, counselors. You're, um, you're the first uh, point of contact of the citizens, whether it's a snow removal garbage or whether it's, you know, the potholes. I mean, it's just the, 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 the things that you just don't want to deal with. You know, what I'm going to do now is I want to show you what somebody sent me. Uh, open garbage like this. Yeah, ripped bag garbage all well, over the snow. Well, if that was a ripped bag, you would have seen remnants of the plastic bag. Yeah. There's nothing there. It's just open garbage thrown on the snow. That's a guy that opened his car door and just dumped everything out. Either that or people coming out of their apartments. And just, just tossing everything. From the window, from the balcony. These are things that I put up with. And this picture was sent to me by a citizen saying, Mary, I'm fed up. Can you do something? If I don't know who it's coming from, I can't. Uh, We recently gave the contract for uh, Echo Cartier to a new new organization called uh, Ville en Vert. Uh, They're in Ahantzik. We put out a public tender. They won the contract. I've had several meetings with them. Uh, They know what my priorities are, and I have certain areas and addresses that I've already passed on to them. They will start doing their their door-to-door sensitivity, Mm -hmm. and what's nice is that they will work in the evenings and weekends, Mm -hmm. knowing that sometimes during the day, people are not It's hard to, yeah, of course. One last thing, um, TMR access. It's been the longest running issue. I, I remember, uh, I'm, I mean, you know, we were kids. Uh, the only time that we were going into TMR was Halloween. <laughs> and, and yet, it's... back then, George, they used to lock the doors. Yeah, they used to lock them. And so I used to drive around because they had better Jean quality Talon. candies there. Yeah. Yeah. Are, are they, I mean, uh, there's no doors locked anywhere now. But there's... Not anymore. But, I mean, you see the stark contrast. I mean, you're driving on Black and there's bushes, there's a fence. What is the issue there? Why can't we open that access into TMR? This is something, it's another city, first of all. It has to be a socially accepted project by the TMR people. Many years ago, uh, I had spoken with uh, the then uh, mayor of TMR, Vera Mm Dunham, who passed away Mm -hmm. a few years back. Uh, and I said, how about opening up Jerry to Rockland Boulevard? Mm-hmm. It will help your people to come out to take Black Eddy and go north or south easily. And it will also help us to go to Rockland Shopping mm-hmm. Center or whatever, to come to visit friends who are, yeah. oops, who come and visit friends in TMR. And she said, Mary, if that happens, the houses along that street will lose value. Yeah. I can't do that. Um, but the houses that will lose value along that street are how many? Five and five, ten buildings? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I think it would be a nice gesture socially uh, because all the people living in TMR use Montreal streets to get out of TMR mm-hmm. and to get into TMR. Well, obviously, they're right in the middle. Exactly. 
And uh, one thing that I have been working on for the longest of times, and I hope we will manage to um, succeed, that is when you're coming eastbound on Chantelon, at the corner of Lacadie, instead of going from Fleet, Beaumont, Lacadie to go north, or instead of going straight through to Wiseman to go north, and uh-huh. then they speed on local streets, yeah. Uh, for them to have access to a left turn to take Lacadie immediately from Jean Talon. Oh, yeah, okay. So I've been working on that. Uh, TMR has said that they did a study that came out with a negative uh, response that it wouldn't be feasible. I believe it can be done. But that technically falls in your district, right? No. Uh, west of Lacadie is them. It's TMR. Yeah, okay. East of Lacadie is Park X. And the people who will be waiting in line to turn oh, they're left, in, they're in they'll TMR. be in TMR. Yeah, but what I'm saying is that... <clears throat> but it's, I, I have hopes that perhaps the agglomeration council, where we have the majority of the city of Montreal sitting there, will one day be able to take it and move it forward. Yeah. Um, let's, let's talk, talk about, about some hot topics, topics in Montreal um, over the last couple of years and maybe even recently. Uh, one of them being the the uh, the migrants coming in from the U.S. I don't like calling them illegal, more like irregular uh, migrants. Just a, you know, a little backup to this story. Um, in many cases, obviously they're coming from the U.S. These are uh, people that you know they, they either came illegally in the U.S. or uh, most of them went in illegally in the U.S. The previous administrations had a special status for them. Uh, and I think back in 2007, when the current government announced that it wasn't going to be renewing these uh, these visas or these special permits, uh, out of fear of going back home, they all came north, uh, a very easy access point being through uh, Quebec. And uh, this is obviously affecting Montreal. Now, what people don't understand is, and, you know, there's a, there's a lot of facts and people are afraid. They're seeing all these people coming in, uh, you know, we're getting invaded. I think people should just, you know, relax a little bit. Um, understand a bit the facts and the facts are that you know I think over 90% of these asylum claims aren't even uh, accepted so they're refused so that's number one the problem that we're having is that because there's so many coming in such a short period of time when they're talking they're coming in by the thousands the the, the delays are so long um, that while all this is happening at the federal level because this is their jurisdiction the provincial and uh, and local actors have to deal um, with these people coming in so they need to be housed. They need uh, services. Their kids are, are their kids going to go to school? Taking care of all that. Um, tell me a little bit about the impact this has had in Montreal. How many do we have right now staying in Montreal, just waiting for their status to? I wish I knew, George. This is information that is not shared with me. And the uh, other, sorry. And the other issue is that most of these people don't even want to stay in Quebec. They want to go to west, t- Toronto, or even further west. But they can't move until their papers are are. Uh, uh, are looked upon so we're just uh, i don't want to say we're stuck taking care of these people i think it's our social duty to do that um but it is affecting the social fabric uh, of montreal because at my level <coughs> first of all we're not responsible for immigration i don't get those stats but what about housing uh it hasn't affected park x no i don't know where they're being housed at this point i um, I wish I could give you more information on that. The only concern that I have is all the people who are who are living in Montreal who have files, active files, they've been here two, three, five years, seven years waiting for their documents. Uh, I'm just concerned if their files are being pushed back because we have more pressing files yeah. with the new uh, coming, you know, the incoming... Uh, well, for sure the resources are... We don't have the, 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 the sufficient resources at the federal level to deal with this. And I understand that it's something that maybe they weren't expecting or it just happened, but I mean, it's, it's two years now. I'm not convinced that there's anything that has changed. Um, I, I, you know, obviously the federal government owed the, the provincial government you know, nearly $200 million for services that you know, technically they're responsible for, but they wouldn't have to deal with them if the delays were much shorter. But because you're at the city level, how prepared is Montreal for this? I mean, there's a huge influx. I, mean, I think we're talking about in 30, maybe 30 or 40,000 
uh, irregular migrants just living in Montreal now? I don't know if they're uh, free to live wherever they want. I'm sure that they have certain areas that is uh, reserved I'm, I'm, yeah, for I'm, them. I don't think they can block them from leaving. Uh, I know that the old uh, Royal Victoria Hospital has been uh, has been in use. There's some facilities in the east. Uh, I don't know where. I, I used to work at the Royal Vic. Yeah. And I don't know where in the at the Royal Vic they'd be housed because it's been closed for so long. That's what, are I, they that's using, what I read somewhere. Are yeah. they using uh, the main kitchen on in the main building? Are they using the Ross? Are they using Al Memorial? I don't know where they're at. So unless I have details, I can't comment. In terms of services and all that, have you been exposed to any of this? In, in Personally, no. No. And they wouldn't be coming to our uh, community uh, groups for assistance, not to my knowledge. Okay. No one's voiced that concern. Is this an issue that, it has, uh, that is being discussed at City Hall? If it is, it will be at the executive level with the administration. They certainly don't share that with us. Okay. Um, let's talk about the marijuana legalization. Uh, again, again, a little bit of a backup story. Uh, so 2018, the federal government legalized and decriminalized the marijuana. Uh, I remember us back in government in 2018. Because it's a federal jurisdiction, you have to accept the fact that it'll, it'll be a law. But I think in the application of the law, the provinces have some sort of jurisdiction. Um, in addition to you know legalizing and decriminalizing marijuana over 18, they also allowed up to four plants to be uh, grown in the houses. And I think that's where we had said, look, if it's up to four plants, we're going to say zero. And there was a little bit of a controversy. I, I know that we were going to contest because um, officially it was going to pass after the last provincial election. We didn't get to do that because we lost. But the new government now, uh, they had campaigned on completely disregarding that law um, and passing in Quebec at least the, the, the limit, the, the minimum age to 21. Now that has created a bit of a problem for the cities because the cities in preparation for this law that passed in October, you had to, to, to adjust a bunch of regulations about where it could be smoked or, or not or you know used. Uh, uh, and then this government comes in and says, look, we're going to change it. We're going to put it to 21 and we're going to ban it from all public spaces. And there's also building owners who say, my building is a non-smoking uh, building. And so where are these people going to smoke? The problem is this, that at least in Montreal, um, you made these changes. And now suddenly, are, are you going to, well, we don't know what's going to happen because there's a, a bill that has been tabled. It's, uh, it's going through consultations and uh, we'll see what happens. I think around maybe summertime. We should have uh, some news in that, but it's going to confuse so many people. And I think even at the municipal level, the city, the, the administration said, look, it's the boroughs. They're going to take care of it. So you have some boroughs. We don't have the means. We don't have the expertise yeah. to take the right decision. I can't All I know is that when I walk down the street and somebody's sitting or just leaning on a building, smoking a toke, um, I don't want to pass by and have to smell that. Especially in our district, which, you know, traditionally park extension, I mean, you know, it's, it, it's known for, uh, you know, the, the drug use and the uh, vulnerable families, um, you know, poor families. The impact that it might have in park extension, like it will in, ev in, any, in, in, any, in any district, but I think in park extension, because we know park extension much more than any than any other district. You've been brought up there. I just fear the impact that that will have. But essentially, what I'm what I'm concerned about is what what happens next. I I, I was remember I remember reading an article. I think it was in the West Island where because the the the, the administration said, look, it's up to the boroughs to decide uh, how to apply it and you know where they can you know they can smoke or not smoke. There, there was a park, and I think on one side of the street. Uh, on one park, they were allowing it public in, in, in the public spaces, so in the they park. They designed an area for smoking? And no, no, no. It, it's a park, and the way the boroughs are, are drawn up, a part of the park is on in one borough, and a part of the park is in another. So that borough said, yeah, yeah, you will allow uh, public smoking, and the other borough said, no, absolutely not. So 
So, they had a, did they build a fence? I, I know that. I don't think they've done anything. But the, uh, the, the, the funny thing is that you're going to be on one side of the street allowed to smoke, and then you're going to cross, go to the other side of the park, and you won't be. So there's a lot of confusion like, uh, there is, similar to this. It's sad <coughs> that a decision was taken federally without giving any support to the provinces and to the municipalities uh, on how to apply and how to safeguard the safety of other citizens. I know that the Quebec government, and it's not because we were we were in place, but you know, very objectively speaking, there was a huge consultation done. Professionals were consulted, the police, uh, the the cities were all uh, invited to come and participate. There, it, was, it was at least a year, maybe if not more than a year of consultation um, and getting uh, the advice from different professionals, whether they were in health, uh, uh, whether, you know, uh, working in the social spheres, the police forces, because they're, essentially they're the ones that are going to have to to deal with this issue, uh, and we came up with. Um, because with the police, I can tell you of one case that I'm aware of, where uh, citizens complained to the police because their back uh, yard neighbors were smoking constantly, and when the wind blew, they couldn't keep their windows open because it was coming into their house. There's nothing you can do now. And so the police said, sorry, it's on their private line. We can't do anything. Mm -hmm. So in the meantime, and that was last year during the hot season, uh, they didn't have air conditioning, but they had to keep their windows closed because they were getting uh, incoming uh, smoke. I think it's going to be inter interesting to see how these, this thing unfolds. Um, there's a lot of opposition I know already up in Quebec about, you know, that gap between the 18 to 21, you're allowing the youngsters, because they're going to smoke anyway. They're going to they're gonna, they're gonna get the, they're they gonna know get where the drugs. They, know, they knew even before where to go and yeah. get it. So, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of people preoccupied that where are they going to get their drugs from or their, their, their marijuana from? Um, I mean, one good thing about this legalization is that right now it's, it's controlled, it's regulated. We know what goes in the product. I mean, there's all these criteria that have to be met. And to some extent, I mean, it's a cleaner, uh, quote-unquote, product. What I've heard is that they've already uh, they're depleted out of stock. their supply. Yeah, they're out of stock. They, 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 didn't, <laughs> they, didn't, foresee, yeah, they didn't foresee how, uh, uh, how strong a market of Montreal uh, was going to be. But um, in Park Extension, I heard a lot of people uh, concerned. With the legalization. We have person. a lot of young families, yeah. George, and it's important. We don't want to give these young children growing up in our neighborhoods the idea that it's okay. If they don't need it for medicine reasons, uh, how do you tell them that recreational use of it can hurt you in yeah. the, long, the long run? Look, I'm on the fence with this because, uh, you know, I grew up in Park X and, I mean, you know, we saw kids smoking up and... It's a reality, and we can't just be blind uh, to that reality. Uh, the fact that we know now that it's a bit more controlled and regulated, that's fine. But I'm on the fence with regards to um, creating an environment where it's okay now. Right? This is what worries me much more than anything else. And young people are usually curious. They want to see what it's like. Mm -hmm. And if they, they, they get used to the high that... Can it open the door to experiment with other drugs? And this is the issue. Now, I don't, have, I don't have a problem with decriminalizing it, but legalizing it is a whole other level. And I think that maybe we could have done it more progressively, which was the recommendation that a lot of professionals um, gave during those consultations. Of course, there's nothing. It's, I mean, it's not in our control. It's, it's the federal government that, takes these, uh, that makes these decisions, and we just have to live by it. But I was just wondering, where does Montreal stand, and um, how do you see this, and you know, what are we to expect? <coughs> Some bureaus have taken decisions, others have not. We're waiting to see the guidelines from our provincial yeah. government because, uh, you know, sometimes a lot of energy is put into certain things and then a decision is taken and all that work goes down the drain. For sure. So, Have you heard from citizens, though, uh, concerned? Well, the families are. Yeah. Families are. Uh, let's talk about the pink metro line. Yes. Uh, the current mayor, Valerie Plant, uh, it was probably one of her, the biggest, uh, elements in her campaign, creating this new, uh, uh pink, pink line. line. 
how realistic is it? Is it necessary? Uh, especially knowing that the government now has invested money in expanding the blue line uh, further east. Well, the blue line was scheduled, if I'm, if I remember, perhaps even before then, from 2001. Mm -hmm. We had gone there. We had visited. I was on the Commission of uh, Public Transport, and to go all the way to Anjou mm -hmm. since 2001. We're 2019. Yeah, but now I it's mean, happening. Now it's happening, so it's nothing new. The, the question I have is, you have this huge project that Montreal is proposing, and instead of giving that project the attention, uh, you're moving forward with a whole other project, uh, well, which, like you said, it's not new. The blue, the blue line to go to Anjou has been on the table since 2001. We finally have the funds and the support to finalize it. So before we go to another new line, can we finalize mm -hmm. that? And also... Seeing the congestion uh, from the West Island into Montreal and back out to the West mm -hmm. Island, can we create something and give some kind of services yeah, to, to those citizens Island. as well? Well, there's the REM now, right? The, the electric chain that yes. uh, that's going to happen. Uh, we don't know how long that's going to take. But this pink line, it just seems that it, it's blocking for the mayor, both federally and provincially. She doesn't seem to be getting any doors opening. Um is it because the federal and the provincial governments uh, don't feel that it's a necessity at this time? Um, <coughs> you know, everybody who comes into uh, power uh, always has something, a project, something that they hold to heart, and they push forward for it. Uh, at the same time, you have other two governments that need to fund it. Mm -hmm. Because you can't do it on your own. Of course not. Now this, this there's got to be some studies. There's got to be well, yeah. you know they have to have well, their reasons. Look, this this particular project we're talking about um, close to six billion dollars, and I think they can complete it within six years. Twenty nine stations. It, it's, it's it's very unrealistic. It's, unreal, it, it's leaving from Lachine, which is in the southwestern uh, end of Montreal, crossing through the center and uh, kind of going uh, northeastern up to Montreal North. It covers a huge um, area. Uh, going through the city diagonally. Yeah. Is there any other way that can be done? Who knows? But um, is that is there a need for that route? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Well, that's the biggest argument right now with the REM coming in. It's going to pretty much occupy that space. Uh, how pressing is it for the current mayor? Is she, is she still pushing that project? Yes. If uh, somebody the other day put in, a, sent out a, fic, uh, a picture, uh, she's taking advertisement inside the metro mm -hmm. on her pink line. You know, huge uh, billboards There's a lot inside of, the yeah, metro. The, the, they're, they're, sensitiz they're sensitizing the population, especially now with all, the, all, you know, all these news coming out about crowded stations. And she's taking advantage of that to say, look, well, you know, if we had the pink line, that would have been resolved. She's, invi she's invited the, the Quebec put in Premier. Extra, put in extra wagons. Yeah. At a much faster frequency. Yeah. Perhaps that would be uh, a more uh, today. Uh, it will perhaps meet the needs of today faster by putting in extra cars, mm -hmm. extra wagons. Um, something happened uh, recently that uh, I surprised me. The Royal Mount project, a uh, huge development project, intersections of 15 and 40. Uh, you know, we're talking about close to uh, two billion dollars uh, mixed-use development. It's an project. incredible investment, huge project. But how doable is it? How are people going to get there, and how are they going to leave? So this, well, this is the thing. Now, the city has kind of blocked it for now. Uh, I don't know if they had authorized it before because I know that the work had already started. We're talking about you know uh, close to four million square feet of land. You know, forty football fields. 6,000 housing units, a theater complexes, hotels, commercial, um, office spaces. Huge development in a rather it's, it's dull... A beautiful, it's a beautiful area. It will revitalize that area. Oh, absolutely. But before you get there... But you see, this is on T, in TMR, in Tanamont Royal. It's on their land. So all this development and pre-planning and so on took place there. It They never uh, discussed it with Montreal. Mm -hmm. So once again, they're densifying their area, but the congestion is that, will spill over. Mm -hmm. Is that the main issue? The traffic? Uh, and the, Absolutely. Yeah. 
That's what everybody's talking about. Already that area is congested. Mm -hmm. uh, during the uh, peak times, it's a snail's pace for cars. Mm -hmm. So unless they open up something, I don't know how the incoming visitors or users to that area and the outgoing users of that area will coincide with the existing congestion <coughs> problem. I just have an issue, and you know, we are talking about it before uh, in Park Extension. Obviously, this is much bigger uh, than the development projects happening in Park Extension, but it just feels that when something is happening, there's always um, a group that just, you know, they, they have to block things from developing. And, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty optimistic person by nature. I just can't believe that, you know, the city wasn't able to sit down and discuss and find solutions to whatever problem they think. And I, I read that, you know, most, the biggest issue is the traffic, um, uh, the traffic jams that that will potentially create. Of course, there's conflicting and contra uh, There's existing traffic jams right now, George. Yeah, and there's contradicting figures. I mean, each group is making their own study. One is coming up with, you know, know 70,000 cars uh, at peak time versus uh, another study coming out with 25. Uh, arguments saying that, oh, you know, there's a metro station nearby, so this development project is going to increase more uh, users of public transit, so it's not going to be that bad. It's It just feels as though we're blocking and it's a huge project and it's the same developers, you know, we're in the South Shore of Montreal, we have a similar project, it's the same promoters, the same developers uh, in the South Shore where they created a, a huge development project at the intersections of the, the 10 and 30 highway. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a source of pride for everybody living down here. We're like, yeah, look what we have, you know. Of course, it's much different, right? I mean, we're not going to compare the core of Montreal. The, the Cary Circle has always been Absolutely. problematic. Mm -hmm. Even with the new development that they created, that's uh, relieved part of the congestion, it's still problematic. Now, it's not in the south side of the 40, it's on the northwest side of the 40. Mm -hmm. I can't see how somebody from Park X can go there unless we take maybe Jean Talon and then De Carry to get there. Definitely not from the 40. Um, I don't know, but you see, TMR started the project, all the studies, the exchanges with the promoter, none of that was shared with the city of Montreal until almost, you know, until the project has almost, almost finished its process. Uh, then we hear about it and wait a sec, how are the cars going to go through the month? Then so, so we have to yeah. do a study to create ways of the, you know, the, the circulation around the project. So explain to me how the jurisdiction works even within the city. So this is happening in a borough that isn't part of Montreal, right? No. Uh, it's a city, not a borough. A uh, city, yeah. Mm -hmm. City of Mont Royal. Why would the city of Montreal have a say if it's happening in that city that technically is not part of the greater Montreal? Well, it is part of the greater Montreal. Yes, uh, it is part of the greater Montreal, but the uh, users of that complex, of that project, will be... The, the transit, the in-transit and the out-transit will be happening on Montreal streets. Mm -hmm. And it is right next to a, a, a very heavily congested circle, mm -hmm. which is the carry circle. That's why Montreal has to be involved. Montreal has to be involved in, in the studies for circulation, where they're going to be coming in from. Look, Rockland Center was created in TMR, but every, I would say, Friday, Saturdays, I don't know about Sundays, uh, on Lacadie, <coughs> going in and out, there's two police uh, cars. Yeah, and directing traffic. Directing traffic into and out of the center. Yeah, but you still have them on the other side, on Rockland Street, where there's also um, uh, heavy traffic on, 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 the, on the side of TMR, mm -hmm. on Rockland. So, obviously, you're developing... But they, there's no need for the police over there because it moves. Don't forget that on Rockland, there's no exit from the highway onto Lacadie. Everything's going into the highway from there. Yeah, okay. from Rockland. I understand. Whereas on the Lacadie side, you've got it people coming out. in from Laval. You've got people coming off the uh, 40 uh, off the Metropolitan, and that is their way of coming into Lacadie. Uh, and the Lacadie, I've never seen it before. They fix the Lacadie Circle. We never had congestion on Lacadie. Mm -hmm. Since the Lacadie Circle was created, 
everybody uh, is well, getting Well, that's a huge there. mess of a project, to it be is. honest with you. It's, it is. it's really not efficient. And when they first gave me the presentation and they said, well, the way the exit will be, if people want to go north on Likely, they have to go through uh, Kremazi, over the yeah. Krem, uh, curbs, uh, over... Uh, the overpass. Overpass. Yeah. And that's 800 cars that were coming over into Park Edge, mm -hmm. congesting that area. It's a mess. I don't understand why they changed it. It was so simple before. It was a nice little circle. circle. You well, could go anywhere you want. And I remember back then, I made a lot of noise. Uh, the representatives from the Quebec government asked me, Mary, wouldn't it be easier if we uh, donated a, uh, a million five hundred to Park X to create something for Park X. I says, no, thank you. Take some candy. I need, I, no, <coughs> that <coughs> kind of yeah. candy, no. I said, you need to fix that corner because we can't get into our area and people, you, you're increasing traffic. Man, well, obviously, I mean, I'm a user um, of, of the circle. I've, it, it's, it's frustrating. But going back to the Royal Mount, what's Any next? building, any project, George, whether it's on somebody else's land that overloads or uses Montreal streets, uh, even in Park X, every project, I used to be the president of our urban planning uh, committee, uh, every project that comes in, we look at uh, circulation in the area and how it will affect. And so we make propositions on where the exits, the entrances to the garage and so on should be. So this is a major project mm -hmm. They should have worked with the city back then so that we can develop some kind of strategy together. So are you going back to the drawing table or, I mean... I, Again, I, that's not at my level. Yeah. Uh, it's the, administ the actual administration right now that are working with TMR and with the uh, public consultation. I would personally love to see that project go through just because I'm, 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 a, I'm a huge... A fan is a huge supporter of any development project, to be honest with you. It's going to create jobs. It's going to create... Um, First and foremost, it's going to revitalize a very dull and industrial-looking yes. part of the city, mm -hmm. number one. What I'm also uh, thinking of, what's going to happen to downtown core of Montreal with Valerie Plant's idea of removing parking from St. Catherine Street, enlarging the sidewalks, and uh, uh, being I, a one-lane eastbound, that's, what I heard. Yeah. that's going to... It is that going, going through? through? That's her project, and she's pushing it through. Oh, my God. It's her administration. But the businesses are going to die. The businesses We're going to have die. a ghost town again. I remember back in the uh, mid-'90s, Mr. Bork worked very hard to try to revitalize that area mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, followed through with uh, Tremblay, mm -hmm. Denis Coderre. Uh, Denis thought of uh, putting in the... Uh, <coughs> Uh, heated sidewalks yeah. to create a safe area for the pedestrians and users. Huge investment, but in, um, uh, in the long run, in the long run positive. Of course. Montreal does not have weather as we experienced the last couple of weeks, weather where you're going to have a lot of pedestrians. And yes, the downtown core is being uh, developed and densified with also uh, residents, but you need more than just the downtown residents to be able to provide uh, income to the businesses along St. Catherine Street. I, I saw what happened along St. Lawrence, where for the longest time there were, you know, there was huge road infrastructure uh, projects over there. So many businesses closed down because of, you know, accessibility issues. And, you know, obviously, I mean, when you're closing down the street, the sidewalks, the businesses suffer. And this happened within, whatever, a year, something like that. George, you Imagine. also have to consider that uh, the first year that uh, the present administration took over, uh, the taxes for commercial businesses skyrocketed three times more than what they were paying. Mm -hmm. uh, the residential area, the residential buildings got a, a hike in taxes. Well, Park well. X is one of the well, got one of the highest uh, yes. tax uh, tax hikes. Yes, because the valuation of the buildings went skyrocket as well but what i my point is that the commercial end of all montreal businesses went up three times somebody mm -hmm. was paying three thousand dollars was now paying nine thousand mm -hmm. dollars somebody was paying ten thousand was paying thirty thousand that's a huge hike yeah. if they're going to create a ghost town downtown 
How are the owners going to be paying? Most expensive real estate in Montreal on top of exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's amazing to me. I mean, there's no research. There's no... I mean, how do you come up with a decision like that? Is there any... You would have to ask their administration. But is there any consultation? I mean, okay, we have an idea. Let's pave uh, St. Catherine. We'll turn it into one lane. I don't believe there was consultation. Perhaps after the fact that they decided to do it, just like they did for closing the Camille... Uh, yeah, the, the Mont Royal, the street right. that goes over Mont Royal. Yeah. That's right. And then they backpedaled they, on that finally. Well, they didn't backpedal. Uh, they haven't taken the final decision, but they did a pilot project before they did the consultation by closing it during peak tourism season. For sure. Uh, where every person visiting Montreal with friends... Uh, that was where we would take them. You'd take them to the Outlook on one side, mm -hmm. then you cross the mountain, you see the beauty of it, and then you go over to the West Mount mm -hmm. Outlook, and you see Montreal from a dif different uh, location. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes when I was coming home, I'd take uh, uh, Cote de Neige, uh, Guy Cote de Neige, and then yeah, go no, through the mountain, for tourism, it calms you. But it's not only, uh, you know? it's, it's only about tourism. It, it's, a, it's a huge shortcut coming in from downtown if you want to cross over uh, into Outremont, for example, or even coming into Park Extension. I've used it many times. But not only as a shortcut. You know, when, you're, when you've had a busy day, a full day, just driving through the <coughs> mountain, you feel like you're in another world. Mm -hmm. So it tends to calm you down. By the time you get home, you're okay again. Uh, for many reasons. This is our... You know, it, it's our uh, landmark, mm -hmm. if you will. Few cities can say you have such a beautiful mountain and it's a nice drive, calms people down. Uh, you, they closed it at the peak tourist season from May to October. And then they opened it again for the winter. Uh, you know what? If, it, if the reason for closing it was to make it safe for cyclists, there's enough space for them to build a safe cycling path because the people who could have enjoyed our mountain last year, families, large families, seniors who need to drive up, park close to uh, Beaver Lake mm -hmm. uh, to take their equipment for a barbecue out there and the, the, the toys for the children to play. They didn't go because it was not accessible for their families. Look, I can understand the flip side of the coin. We've seen, we've seen quite a few accidents, deadly accidents, unfortunately, uh, happening with cyclists. Yes. Uh, Again, I'm a very optimistic person. I'm pretty sure there's a solution. Safeguard. Uh, the, yeah. the same way they build uh, cycling paths elsewhere that are protected, do yeah. it. Yeah. Instead of cutting off the road to all... If they were to cut off or stop cars from roads where there have been accidents, all our streets would be stopped. Mm -hmm. They'd be all close to cars. But what they've done in certain areas is they've built... Uh, a bike path that's protected. Why couldn't they do that there? Mm -hmm. uh, la last topic, um, baseball. Uh, a month ago, we can uh, Well, I mean, it's been years now that there's a group uh, composed of primarily very wealthy businessmen that want to uh, spark, uh, you know, a, a, another baseball uh, team uh, in Montreal. We need the infrastructure, obviously, the, the, the old Olympic Stadium doesn't cut it anymore, logistically doesn't make sense, they want to focus on downtown. Last month, uh, um, I read in the news that they were suggesting the Peel Basin, which is a fantastic uh, spot. It's been the area that's been cited for years. Okay. What's, uh, what's happening? Is this something that we're going to see? Is it something that you're pushing for? Do we? Is it something worth it? I'm going to be very honest with you. I never liked baseball. I'm not a baseball fan. I enjoyed playing it when I was young. But then again, when you're young, you just enjoy playing anything. I remember going to the Olympic Stadium and falling asleep during baseball games. <laughs> the, 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 the nosebleed section tickets were like, what, maybe 10, 15 bucks? I don't know. We used to go there, and I would literally fall asleep. I, I, I'm not a baseball fan. Uh, uh, I know that the... For uh, my three children, my oldest still plays. She does? Yes. Sylvia. Paul. Yeah. Yes. I can understand there's a portion of the population that... Uh, I, I know the, the the former mayor of Montreal was a huge fan. He did uh, huge steps in, you know, negotiating and trying to get a team back into Montreal. Personally, I think if it's in the downtown area, anything can work. It's going to stimulate uh, uh, growth. It, yeah, the businesses are going to grow. 
Um, is it? It's also good because a lot of people come. But you know, you do have baseball lovers, and they will come from other cities to attend games yeah, and downtown yeah, not, core with the hotels. Every, yeah, and but everything. not every not every game though. Do we have? Uh, and I mean, I don't know the I don't know the statistics. Do we have enough fans? to be able to maintain the team financially. The big argument right now is do we need to build, uh, you know, over, you know, the private and, and public funds, obviously. Uh, and the huge argument right now, they're comparing it to the, um, to the complex that Quebec City built, the Videotron uh, Center, where they built it in view of getting the Quebec Nordiques back into, uh, into Quebec. It hasn't happened. But at the same time, it's a multifunctional... Uh, uh, infrastructure. infrastructure. It's been used for concerts. Uh, I mean, it's it's a huge place. I mean, financially, I don't know how they're doing. I don't know the financials, but so the big argument is, um, why would we spend public funds? But look what's happening in Quebec. Uh, we did all that for the Nordiques. We wouldn't get the Nordiques back. I have no answers for you because, again, uh, that information uh, has not been uh, shared with me. Uh, I know that uh, the former mayor, Denis Coderre, uh, he loves baseball. He used to play it when he was young, and uh, he's been following games. He, he will travel to see games uh, elsewhere, and I am sure that there are studies, and with the private sector, that you know they'll be investing uh, to build the... Uh, yeah. They're requesting public funds. This is this is this is how I feel. I think that the government has an obligation to invest this, even if it's corporate or business, um, especially if it's going to stimulate growth and if it's going to contribute to the to any sort of growth, whether it's economic, social, whatever it may be. Especially in the downtown core of Montreal, I think the 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 the, the consequences of that happening there in that location, I can only say that they're positive. I don't see why the government wouldn't um, give any uh, any public funds for that. At the same time, then you have to just think, are we a baseball city? I think it comes down to that. <clears throat> the proper um, promotions uh, and proper uh, backing and marketing, uh, anything can be successful. Uh, all I know is that with the football uh, at the McGill Stadium, it, uh, it, it, it it's huge. It was a boom because when the, the Alouettes came back and they put them in the old Olympic Stadium in the East End, was they working. were going downhill fast. Uh, look, look what they did. They needed the city support back mm -hmm. then. I I was responsible for sports, uh, and I remember going to Calgary for the Grey Cup. Mm -hmm. Uh, to bring it to Montreal with Mr. Brook because yeah. a year after they played in Montreal. Uh, the exchanges we had was to increase uh, the seating additional, space. Yeah. additional seats as well as the media section. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the time it was done, they also worked out uh, a plan to have special buses bring the people yeah. up from the metro mm -hmm. Because the car uh, parking space... Oh, no, forget it. it it's yeah. in existence over there. Yeah, no. And it's wonderful to see all those people flocking over to watch the games. It saved the team. Absolutely. I think downtown is a must. There's no other uh, option, I think, in, in the back of my mind, that it would work. you got to bring all the elements together and plan it well. Here's the thing about Montreal. I think Montreal is a great city, obviously. There isn't enough uh, of these events happening... Uh, on a yearly basis that will attract uh, you know, tourism, the, the, the athletic tourism, sports. right? Mm -hmm. So we have the Rogers Cup that is happening, which is huge. There were issues there again, and you probably know this better than anyone about expanding and, you know, doing the clay courts. People protested. Um, you know, yeah, now there's... But you know what it is? Sometimes the protesting, the reasoning. Uh, when I hear that... They don't want any construction because they want the mountain to Yeah, be. they want to see the mountain. But, I mean, if you're in that element, when you're on a Jarry Park, you're sitting down on beautiful greens, uh, green area that's been developed for families around the lake that we have, mm -hmm. seeing the ducks, are you going to be swayed to look to see where the mountains is or are you going to enjoy your surrounding? But besides all that, Mary, I mean... I don't know why the focus is put on that rather than the the economic um, consequences that it can have, positive uh, economic uh, 
consequences that that can have. Mm-hmm. And like, like I said, we don't have that, that many big, you know, uh, events happening. There's the F1. There's the the Rogers Cup. Obviously, the Alouettes is huge. Montreal Canadiens. I mean, hockey here is a religion, so that I don't see anything happening with that. I mean, there's no way in hell that hockey will ever be taken away from no, the city. No. But we saw the drawbacks that it has when I mean, Alouettes came into the Montreal is a metropolis now. Yeah, we are a beautiful, huge metropolis. Let's work in that vein. We're not a small town. And so we need to highlight, we need to show, be a showcase of all our strong points. And by continuing to bring in uh, tourism and tourism, Mm -hmm. basically. Tourism doesn't have to be from across the world. Just local Canadian tourism Mm -hmm. coming into Montreal. We are a beautiful Francophone city. It's going to Europe, uh, but being still local... uh, and there's a lot of people who love that mm-hmm. aspect. We are a beautiful city. And uh, our friendliness, our willingness to, to work with people and the service uh, quality that we offer, tourism, I think we have all the elements we need to enhance, embrace, and to continue that. <coughs> I, I agree with you. I agree with you ent- uh, entirely. Uh, let's wrap it up. Uh, you're getting ready for another election. You're running again? Absolutely. That's awesome. Very happy to hear that. Thank you. Um, there's still a lot of work in Park X, and um, there's a need. I truly believe that I work well with my citizens, and the fact that I've got a history before even I was elected, that I work with all communities equally. I did it for our sports, with Panelinos and with PYO. I did it within the travel industry where everybody for me was equal and I offered the same service to somebody who gave us $5,000 as opposed to $1.5 million. To me, everybody deserves to receive equal services. And one way that I've always managed Park X is that we are uh, citizens of Montreal and we should have equal services just as the people next door to us uh, or Uchiman. St. Leonard, St. Laurent, mm-hmm. we're all the same citizens. We all pay the same taxes. So I work towards offering the best service I can to my citizens. How's the party getting ready? Uh, are you going to have another leader or are you going with uh, Lionel? Is he still Lionel, interim? Lionel is still interim. And even from the beginning, he told us that he's not planning to run as mayor. Uh, are you going to have time, a, a leadership campaign now for, the, for your party or uh, how does it work? It will, it will come about, mm-hmm. uh, but closer to the to the, date. Uh, yeah. to the date, because for somebody who's already employed, they're not going to start promoting themselves as the leader of a party yeah. for an eventual campaign uh, until we're closer. Okay. We're looking at 20, uh, the election is in 2021. 20, 21. So by so November, December, January. By early next year. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Mary, you're a legend, uh, and I'm very happy that you came here. Uh, and uh, Thank you for having me, George. I appreciate it. I appreciate it, and uh, I'll be seeing you around for sure. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Keep well.